Hello. All right. Um, very good morning to everybody. I think we have a fair amount of participants who have uh, joined us today for this webinar. So I am Nandita Barua. I'm the country representative of the Asia Foundation in India, and I want to extend a very warm welcome to all our speakers and all our participants and attendees who are attending this uh, webinar today. Um, I think it's, it's exciting for us that we have such an eminent list of uh, speakers who are here today with us. We have uh, you know, speakers from KPMG, from Terry, uh, from RIS, from IFC, and these are all organizations who have been at the forefront and individuals who have been at the forefront of this entire discourse and also the uh, you know, inputs on the technical and financial side of uh, issues related to green energy and climate resilience. So I think um, we, we are really excited. And I think as we have more speakers and more participants uh, joining us, I just wanted to give a quick uh, overview um, of, of the Asia Foundation and uh, how we are engaged in this uh, work. Um, as some of you know, the foundation has actually been uh, working on issues of renewable energy and power sector uh, issues for a while now. Um, primarily, we are basically a partner to the Australia Aid on their SDIP program, which looks at the food, water, energy nexus. Um, and as a part of our work under that program, we have been convening the uh, South Asia Renewable Energy Summit. Um, last year, it was done in November in partnership with RIS, and uh, Dr. Dash was uh, one of our main technical experts when we did that. And then, of course, IFC, who is also a partner of uh, SDIP, were um, also engaged in, in this entire discourse at different levels with the foundation. So we are taking up from that. And I think as we all recognize today that uh, COVID has had a lot of negatives. It's put our lives out of gear. Um, it's made it very difficult for us to resume or even get back to what we understood to be normal. But at the same time, I think there's also no denying that this, uh, you know, this kind of complete shutdown and lockdowns and uh, derailing of what was normal had some uh, benefits by default, um, not by design. And most of them are related to the entire environmental climate gains that have been made. And I think... Uh, Though, uh, though it's, it's, it's a hard comparison, right? You have an economy which went into crisis, but on the other hand, we thought that the environment and climate was going into a major crisis just before COVID happened. And with COVID and with the entire world coming to take some very harsh steps in relation to um, industry, in relation to normal economic activities, the environment almost kind of began uh, somehow to heal. And I think that uh, gave a lot of people hope and then the question in everybody's mind, as I'm sure in all of yours, is that will we be able to take advantage for these gains that we have made by default in a very fast-paced manner as we start reopening and as we start addressing the economic challenges that the world is faced with? And as we have to now push forward for greater economic growth, greater industrial output, uh, more focus on homegrown, home-developed uh, industry, not just in India, uh, where Atmanirbhar is the buzzword, but also in everywhere in the world, I think there is this understanding of being more reliant on yourself, therefore pushing your more uh, home industries, home uh, you know, sector growth uh, higher. The question, of course, is that is this, is this growth and is this push towards what's going to be the new normal, is that going to be driven by uh, cleaner, greener energy choices? Because we have seen the impact on the environment and its ability to heal at a really fast pace if we can keep uh, you know, keep the, keep the environment green and clean. And I think there has been a lot of gain made in the sector of renewable energy, be it solar, wind, hydro. The question is, how do we harness those as we move forward? How economically viable are they? How sustainable would they be? Um, and what would we need to do to make it so? I think it's with this agenda that we are having this uh, webinar today to hear from the experts. Uh, to hear from also the experts who are speaking, but also the uh, attendees who are joining us, who are all experts in, in this field uh, of you know, energy and economics, energy and social growth um, as we go forward. So um, I will not take more time and I will not introduce these speakers because that's a job I'm going to hand over to my colleague Anandia Upadhyay, who is a senior consultant on renewable energy for the Asia Foundation. Um, and so Anandia will take, uh, have the privilege of introducing our eminent speakers 
And then I think she will take us through this webinar um, and the Q&A. So with that, a very warm welcome to all of you. And thank you so much for joining. We have about almost 48 to 50 attendees who are uh, you know, attending this. Um, and I'm sure more will join. So this is going to be an exciting seminar, which I think webinar, which I think we will, uh, you know, it's not a one-off for us. Sage was not one-off. We had agreed that we will have more of these convenings. Uh, it's just that we are doing it virtually and we will continue to do that, do this and try and create a much stronger policy discourse, hopefully collectively for a cleaner, greener resurgence. Um, thank you so much. And I hand it over to you, Anandia, to take on the conversation. Thank you, Nandita. Good morning, everyone. Before I formally begin the webinar, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Participants will remain on mute and videos are disabled. Speakers will have 10 minutes each for their talk. Please put your questions for the speakers in the Q&A box at the bottom. The speakers will take some of these questions in the Q&A session later. I encourage you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and recording of this webinar will be made available later. I welcome you all again to TAF India's webinar, Opportunity in Crisis, Green Energy as the New Normal. I would now like to introduce our eminent speakers. We have Mr. Anish Day, who is the National Head for Energy and Natural Resources at KPMG in India. Our next speaker is Ms. Anjali Garg, Energy Specialist, Financial Institutions Group, Climate Finance Advisory, APAC at the International Finance Corporation. We have with us Dr. Ashwini Kumar, Senior Fellow and Senior Director for Renewable Energy Technologies Division at Terry. He's also the former Managing Director of Solar Energy Corporation of India. And we have Dr. Priyadarshi Dash, who is an Assistant Professor at RIS. The underlying theme of this webinar is that climate and energy are closely linked. The world entered 2020 with warnings from several energy and climate experts that, century, that countries were not doing enough to keep global temperatures below the targeted two degrees Celsius rise by century end, even though renewables had become cost competitive with coal globally. A recent research says that current tariffs in the Indian solar sector, which are hovering at rupees 2.5 to 2.8 per unit, are at about 20 to 30 percent below the cost of existing thermal power in India and up to half the price of new coal fired power. These lucrative prices provide enormous opportunities to invest in clean, zero emissions energy. Still, investments in renewables need to double in the late 2020s for a sustainable development pathway for the world, says the International Energy Agency. Both the IEA and International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, have noted that a global recovery strategy from the onslaught of COVID-19 must be a green strategy and that renewables should be the backbone of economic recovery. Policymakers world over are at a point where they have the opportunity to redesign energy choices of the future. This webinar seeks to emphasize that the new paradigm in energy with the cheap renewables options represents opportunities for greater inclusion, employment, and economic efficiency that can benefit India and the South Asian region through India. On that note, let's welcome our first speaker, Anish Day. He will compare and explain the green components of various stimulus packages, including how such components would make economy self-reliant. Over to you, Anish. Thank you. Thank you, Anandya. And uh, thank you for having me here. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. If I can have the slides on, then I can uh, launch straight in. I appreciate that you know this has to be a terse presentation. I don't have uh, too many slides, just about five or six. And then I have a little bit of a story from the lockdown on the energy sector, how it was played out in the energy sector. So the theme which I'm, I'm going to talk about is on whether green stimulus can repair the global economy and environment. And while we talk about the global economy and environment, a lot of the action is going to be in Asia and in South Asia. So I'm going to direct my attention to the South Asia issues a little bit, maybe more specifically India and South Asia issues a little bit towards the end of the talk. If I can have the next slide, please. Yeah, just an overview of what we are seeing in front of us. It is unprecedented. And uh, you know, the, the top part of the, of the slide talks about two things. One is the scale of the event and the other is the duration, the duration on the x-axis, scale on the y-axis. We're talking of something which is going to be potentially very long. We don't know how long. And it is going to be one of the largest impacts which humanity has seen in terms of economic uh, impacts. 
So uh, potentially the tail of this will run into several years, even if a vaccine is found in the next year, year and a half and can be administered. The economic impacts will last for fairly long and there is a cascading impact of each each action or each uh, uh, you know, you know, deficit in the economy, which plays out uh, very strongly. There are also structural shifts which are going to happen in the economy because of you know, self-reliance. People are trying to find not only you know, economic growth and self-reliance, but also safety and self-reliance, but that changes the world order. So how that will play out, we don't know. But this is clearly you know, uh, the picture that it's going to be a long run and a heavy duty affair for, for the global economy as well as for India. If I just go back to India, uh, our lockdown is now causing consequences, economic consequences, which we possibly didn't imagine. Things have changed so quickly. So if I just go back a month back, we were talking of a small growth, uh, but uh, you know, about a one, one and a half, two percent growth in FI21. Whereas now we are talking of negative degrowth in the overall year of significant scale and we really speaking nobody knows you know and then uh, these are these are things which you haven't seen in the past there is no economic data to fall back on to project into the future so it's all pot shots but it just goes without saying that these are very very deep impacts there are sectors which are hit more than others and that's what is happening to the airlines and tourism sectors they are very very badly hit when they try to come back how they will come back is a, is a big question because they have very large fixed costs, but uh, the, the revenue income from these uh, from from uh, from you know, passengers or uh, you know, people staying in hotels or you know, traveling for tourism is going to be very low, not just for this year, but for on a sustained basis for several years. So how this is going to happen is, is play out as a, is a big question. Uh, and, and we have a challenge around that. We have the question, we don't have the answers around that. The supply chains have been hit very badly. They will recover, but they will have to be rejected. Now, there might be an opportunity over there. We talk about Industry 4.0, and this might be an acceleration of Industry 4.0. But do remember that we are trying to make a lot of positive changes in an environment which is also very vitiated. So it's not easy to figure out what are those changes, how are those supply chains going to play out, what are the interconnections, and, and global supply chains are very, very interconnect, interconnected. So how the new supply chains are going to play out, we don't know. Manufacturing is something which it has been deeply hit across the world, and we can see that happening in the first 24 days in Europe, uh, about uh, 2 million odd units of automobile production was lost. And that's not stopped there. Even when they have restarted, they're finding it difficult to sustain demand. So when we talk about stimulus, we'll come back to that in, in the next uh, few minutes. We are essentially talking about how to get demand back. Uh, and and that's, that's the, going to be the focus. The answers, again, there are not very clear. And finally, all of these cascades to jobs. Even before the uh, COVID happened, while the U.S. job economy was great, the Indian job economy was not great. We were already seeing huge troubles in Europe and other parts of the world. We're also seeing significant amount of stress. Now, as we have seen in terms of the data, we have now seen that the U.S. economy has also turned into a you know, huge amount of joblessness. And uh, the 40, 50 million people jobless is, is a very large number for the U.S. economy especially with people who don't have formal structures uh, to support you know, them in, uh, on the margins, they're very badly hit. But it's not any different for India or South Asia because we have seen what is also, you know, quote unquote, the migrant crisis, how it is playing out. And it's a really a issue which we didn't, we didn't even understand how India worked. And I think we are now trying to get our arms around a problem which we didn't even uh, knew, uh, know that it existed. So, so this is the kind of uncertainties uh, we are talking about, both in terms of effects and in terms of duration. So in that context, what can a green stimulus do? Can I have the next slide, please? So what, is the, uh, what are the objectives of stimulus? And in simple terms, the objective of stimulus is to uh, stimulate demand after a collapse. So if we keep that as simple, then, then it becomes easier to kind of do it because the next steps are very complicated, okay? Because we are trying to align things which are sometimes not completely aligned. And if I had to pick up three legs of what a stimulus could do and a green stimulus could do in particular, it has to deal with the economy, it has to deal with the environment, and it has to deal with employment. 
Sometimes they can coincide, but often they do not coincide. So we have to find that common space where they are coinciding. And if we can't find that common space, we have to make some choices because then we have to prioritize some over other and make that work. You know, so it's not that we are automatic fits. We have to sometimes make them work. And what are the tools available for us to make those work? These are the four principal tools. There could be other subsidiary tools as well, but it's principally government spending, tax cuts, subsidies, and then policy programs. Now, those policy programs might have been there even before uh, the green stimulus had to come in or the stimulus in general had to come in, but some of them get emphasized. So if you see the electricity sector, you can see emphasis on, on uh, privatization coming back in some sense, okay, where the policy programs are trying to push tariff reforms. There's a talk around tariff reforms because otherwise the industry cannot recover. So those kinds of policy programs which where there or ought to have been there sometimes are now getting accelerated by that. But the key thing is to find that common space. And I think that's something which we need to remember. Two things from this. One is that we are trying to stimulate demand back and demand has fallen sharply uh, as we saw in some of the sectors. Even if you see the energy sector, it fell very, very sharply. In the electricity sector, demand fell by 25% in the early days of the lockdown. It has come down back, uh, come back now, and you know, the aggregate demand on the electricity grid is largely where it is in March, or was in uh, March, okay, or, or late February, early March. Is that adequate? <clears throat> the answer is it's not adequate because March itself was seeing subdued demand because in last quarter, the economy was fluttering even before COVID. So the demand was down. If we had to really look at uh, how much we have recovered as compared to where it should have been, we are pretty much at 90% of where it ought to have been in normal circumstances. So we are now looking not at the recovery of demand and being happy about it. We are actually seeing how to make up that remaining 10%. And that's where stimulus has to come. And that's where you know, stimulus has to be the green kind if we have to meet our environmental goals. Can I have the next slide? So when we talk of green stimulus, we're just looking at you know how do we assess what is going to be the or should be the quantum of the stimulus versus what should be the quantum or what should be the proportion of green in the in of, of green component of that. So I was just looking at data from the past, and the last reference we have is from the 2008 financial crisis in the aftermath of that which is the closest relatable to, to what we are seeing, though not quite relatable because today we are seeing a much larger scale of uh, challenges. Now, India did not face the financial crisis uh, that much because we were largely insulated from the global economy at that time. We are not, and certainly we are not insulated from the virus. So we, we are seeing those effects, which we did not see in 2008. But if we have to look at what choices the world made, in 2008, after 2008, uh, there were big, elements of stimulus which came in, uh, large stimulus in, in, in uh, Europe, in China, in the US. But if you look at Europe and China, a very large component of that was green. So 78% of all stimulus in Europe was of the green variety. And that actually propelled a lot of developments in the green uh, energy sector in particular, uh, not just energy, but the whole energy transport. And I'm, I'm going to refer to that for the next pie chart, uh, the bottom. But there was, there was this focus on green, a conscious decision to take uh, green and push green. And a lot of the renewable energy developments which you see in Europe have as been a consequence of that. So if you just go to that pie chart at the bottom, we see that this is where the efforts were, uh, were uh, you know, focused on. Rail, uh, rail about 25%, grid around 17%, buildings around 16.5%, uh, CCS, around 12.4%. Uh, that violet uh, element was renewable energy. It's, it's the legend has gone missing, so about that, but that was a, a slice over there. And water also had a significant stimulus, and then finally low carbon vehicles. So this was a mix which came in. What, when we're st standing here, we see that some things have made major advances. You know, renewable energy in particular has made big advances already on the back of some of that stimulus, but also the general focus, policy focus on renewable energy. And today, as India mentioned, today it's unquestionably competitive, you know, unconditionally competitive in that sense. And I'll show you evidence of that. Then there is low carbon vehicles, industrial energy efficiency, which have all achieved maturity. 
In contrast, if you see CCS, which was allocated a lot of money at that time, really didn't make progress. Energy efficient public transport has also really not made progress that the kind which we wanted to see. Rail, grid, and water were largely mature. They continue to be where they are. So we need to find out which sectors which we need to give stim uh, the stimulus at because what we want is a consequence of that money being spent to generate something which is which is good, you know, which is something useful. So I think that's where we need to identify the tools of the stimulus, which we discussed in the previous slide, those four tools of stimulus, and where do we put that uh, stimulus. Let's go to the next slide. No, just, just the previous one for one minute. Yeah. So, you know, when we're looking at the stimulus, what are we looking at in terms of the candidates as well as what are the sectoral trends? So just wanted to cover in a minute the sectoral trends. Oil, we are going to see a drop in oil demand. That's about IEA says. And these are all IEA statistics. Coal declined by 8%. Gas could decline pretty much uh, fairly high levels. The first quarter decline wasn't bad. Uh, renewables will grow. That is what IEA is saying. And that's because of those factors which we are discussing. And I'm going to show you, as I said, some evidence. Global CAT emissions will go down to levels which were there 10 years ago, 8%. And the key challenge for us is to sustain that. Uh, there's a big risk of rebound of emissions unless we direct the investments of the right places. So that's, that's something which is cautionary. Investments in fuel supplies set to fall sharply. And if you're reading the Guardian today, they're saying that there is a risk that fossil fuel industry is going to see a 25 trillion erosion of value. This is from the Guardian today. And I think that's very interesting because then it means something for the renewable energy sector uh, for sure. But it also means that there'll be a disruption in the global economy if it happens. Because today, while renewable energy is the flavor, there's a big reliance of global economies on fossil fuels and employment on fossil fuels. So we need to understand the dynamics. It's not just that it's, it's all good there because a rapid transition can also cause shocks which we may not be ready for. And finally, that point about China is very troubling. China had done some major progresses in renewable energy, but in the last five years, the amount of capacity and coal they have brought in is actually very worrying. Even now, the amount which is under permitting or construction is very, very large, 135 gigawatts, if you were to believe that. So, so it's a, something which is a big concern because China is the largest emitter in the world. And if it doesn't really mend its ways, then irrespective of what we do, we actually can be in trouble. It might not be good for China as well, but it's bad for the world. So my last operative slide, if you could just pull up that next, is in terms of the debates for India and South Asia in particular. So what are the, and this is where I would like the discussion to go about what is the policy agenda? How should it play out? What are the theaters of play? Which sectors should that money be allocated? What percentage of the stimulus should be green? We don't have a prescription, but this is where, you know, we have a very you know, enlightened audience. We want to hear more about that. What is the available fiscal space? And you know, we talked about uh, 20,000 crores, but a lot of it was relabeled, re repackaged. Actual stimulus is actually much lower. And we have seen a rating strong grade also. So what is the fiscal space? Maybe in Anjali or somebody can give a view on that. Uh, what are the payoffs anticipated short term versus long term? Because some things uh, can have long term positive implications, but really may not help in the immediate term in terms of the in, uh, kind of the recovery plans. How do we balance that? Uh, you need shovel-ready projects for a stimulus to work because you're looking at employment, you're looking at the economy in immediate terms and the environment. But what are the shovel-readiness of the projects? Because we might end up doing shovel-ready projects, but they might not be good for the environment. And this is something which we need to uh, look at carefully. And finally, a few competing uh, priorities. First question is that, is this coal versus renewables or employment versus en environment? And I make that point because you also see that there's a lot of emphasis on mining because it leads to you know, employment generation much more than renewables do, or it leads to financial generation much more than renewables do. And it's local, right? So it's adding to the Indian economy, but it might be against the environmental causes that we have. Is it country specific or it's regional? Because the moment we expand the, uh, the, the, the remit, uh, then it can be lead to very different uh, different solutions. So I think that's important. And the last point which I want to put for this, is it for global good or for public finances? And I, I make uh, you know allegory to 
alcohol, you know, alcohol is not good for, uh, you know, not for global good, but it's very good for public finances. So I think this is, these are the kind of debates which we need to deal with. I'm going to end there, but if I have 30 seconds more, I can just take you through a, a few slides, or maybe, you know, in the course of the discussion, we'll do it. Let's, let's stop here. I just want to uh, tell you that, you know, the positive story which we have seen on renewable energy is very interesting. And uh, we have seen in, before this lockdown happened, renewable energy was hovering at 11, eight and a half percent of the overall uh, power mix. Even after the lockdown, even after the energy demand has increased, it's consistently stayed above 11.5%, 12%. And I'm seeing that a lot of acceptance of renewable energy from the state actors, which we hadn't anticipated. So that's a positive story. If we have time, I'll show some evidence of that later. And in there, I think I've consumed a little more time. Do excuse that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anish. It's always uh, uh, wonderful listening uh, to, to your talk. Always a pleasure. Um, and of course, we can take the points uh, that you want to make um, again in the Q&A session and in the course of the discussion. Uh, thanks again. And now we have Anjali and she will uh, take this discussion and the points uh, put forth by Anish forward and she'll throw light on the new green technologies that could be top candidates to attract financing in the post-COVID world. Over to you, Anjali. Thank you so much, Anindya. I hope you can hear me well. If at any point uh, you see my voice breaking, could you please alert me? Because when Nandita was speaking, you know, I was missing a few words. So if there's a bandwidth issue at my end. Uh, great. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, uh, Asia Foundation, for having me here uh, and share my thoughts. So I remember when uh, Malvika and Anindya were first speaking to me, the question which came to my mind was, you know, what green stimulus, what reforms, you know, because I haven't really seen anything but what has been happening is that every time something is announced i've been doing a deep dive to understand what could be the trickle down effect on clean energy is there something which could you know work for the sector that we all are so concerned with and work with and that's what i'm going to talk about i'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or a little bit less maybe on some of the areas that i think uh, look interesting and could have a promising uh, opportunity for all of us to explore in a port covid uh, environment, especially from a climate finance perspective. So I'll talk about the sectors and then I'll come to the climate finance side of it, which is, you know, the, the financial institutions and the bank that sector and how they should find it, perceive this. Um, so the, the only caveat here is that as Anish also mentioned, you know, there is so much that we need to do to really make this happen. So while these are sectors which I think uh, could have some sort of an impact, some demand, some supply, it is, it, it's going to be challenging. Uh, we'll all need a lot of innovative approaches to be developed for this to scale up, uh, especially in view of the medium and long-term impact that the pandemic is going to have on our business and the economy. So I've been looking at, as I said, on the reform uh, package, there are three uh, sub-sectors in the energy sector that I thought could be of interest, which is energy efficiency, uh, then clean energy solutions for agri and rural. And I think I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that uh, in addition to energy efficiency. And the third one is electric mobility. I will not talk too much about it because we have an expert panelist on this webinar for that. So in all of these three, I can see some impact which may happen as the reforms and the stimulus packages which Government of India has announced uh, you know, begin to be implemented. It is not likely to happen in the short term there's a lot of work which would be needed at the upstream and policy level, but there is a potential for them to really, you know, move uh, India towards a new path of uh, clean energy. So let me begin by talking about energy efficiency. And in Anisha's slide from the IEA uh, uh, points, there was a mention of, you know, how energy efficiency investments have been hit. And that's true. I mean, energy efficiency in any case is not an easy sector uh, for for either the clients or the customers to invest in or for a financial institution or an investor to come up uh, and give money for, even though it continues to be one of the most important uh, sectors in the energy sector, especially uh, you know, when you look at uh, in any country's uh, NDC targets and the Paris Agreement. So for example, in the case of India, as most of us know, 50% uh, of our total emission reduction can potentially and technically be achieved through energy efficiency initiatives, of which maximum potential is in the industrial sector. And of the overall, almost 10% uh, theoretically could come from MSMEs. And a whole lot of packages have been announced, reform packages have been announced for MSME, but absolutely no linkage to a green stimulus or a green 
portion. That, that's a really big missing link. But looking at it from an opportunity perspective, because uh, you know I'm, I'm seeing it as a, as a private sector developer because I work with most of them. Uh, you know, I, I really see that there is still an opportunity in that sector. Uh, for individual businesses, obviously, you know, it's a no-brainer that adopting energy efficiency measures does reduce their costs. It increases profitability. It helps them future-proof their energy expenses, you know, against any sort of price rises. But these are all things which have existed even before the COVID and the pandemic. And still energy efficiency, especially in the industrial sector, has really, really struggled. And one of the reasons there has been lack of capital, lack of knowledge, uh, lack of awareness. So all of that will still need to be, uh, you know, that gap will still need to be filled in. But with the reforms which have been announced, there could be a potential opportunity for all stakeholders to come together and move our industry, especially MSMEs, uh, to lead the clean energy revolution in India. What we need to do is for MSMEs to understand that they have to have a long-term game plan. You know, most of them are family-owned traditional businesses using, you know, conventional traditional energy uh, stuff. And, and that's exactly what needs to change. They need to have a vision on you know how they really need to grow and scale up with all the impetus on you know uh, go go local uh, what we're really wanting them to do is to grow and scale up and be comparable to some of the other computer competitors that we have uh, globally and for that to happen uh, they have to or must look at energy efficiency which and because energy accounts for almost 50 percent of their manufacturing cost so if we miss uh, this then this is a huge opportunity that india would have missed you know in any case it was difficult now the entire focus is on, you know, uh, starting businesses again, uh, getting the profitability up, you know, increasing manufacturing. So nobody is really going to think about green. And that is where, you know, all stakeholders need to come together and ensure that, you know, we kind of do not uh, miss this. And this is where, you know, I, I, I would have hoped that we had some government stimulus and recovery package, which kind of nudged the industry towards that. We haven't seen that yet. Maybe in, in, in the future it will uh, come. But this is something which, you know, could be a potential uh, area, which could be a low-hanging fruit uh, where both customers as well as investors could have interest. And I'll come to the investor interest uh, later on. Uh, the second sector that I want to talk about is rural and agri and how it links to clean energy. This is also an area and sector which has been very close to my heart for the last few years because I've been working mostly uh, in off-grid and distributed generation. And I truly believe that this is something where there could actually be both demand as well as supply. So it would not just be a supply-driven clean energy market going forward, but we could have uh, both, both, both working together, which really is needed for any clean energy market to grow right now. If, they, if there is no commercial interest or a commercial business model, things are not going to progress. So as far as this sector is concerned, uh, there was some movement in India already. I think India has been leading this revolution uh, globally. We were the four, uh, we were running on the forefront and then Africa took over, but, you know, on the productive use and, you know, really working uh, in, in agri uh, space and rural economies, India, India has made significant progress with a number of technologies being uh, piloted. But the progress has been slow, mainly because there was lack of financing and also the fact that there wasn't uh, you know, we were not seeing a huge demand coming in. Uh, my personal view is that, you know, in view of the reverse migration, again, something which Anish spoke about, the reverse migration that we are seeing, especially in India, the focus on rural economy is, is critical, it's very important, and we've seen how government reform packages and stimulus has focused on that. What we really need in India now is to focus on income generating opportunities in rural areas, because the reverse migration which has happened is a whole lot of people now uh, in these uh, in these areas who are not willing or wanting to come back uh, you know to the life that they had previously and they are going to be on the lookout on how to really take uh, themselves to the next level by staying where they are where they were born where they grew up now so this is this is going to be a big ask and need from the people so only you know public finances is not going to be enough private sector will have to come and play a role and this is where i think the agri reform could actually play a role so i am not an agri expert but I've been reading about the agri reforms announced, especially, uh, and, and if they're implemented in the true spirit, then I think renewable energy and clean energy can play a big role, uh, especially in climate smart agriculture, which goes you know, way beyond just solar water uh, pumping, the entire focus on supply chain development, food processing, 
uh, cold chain and storage, uh, allied activities like dairy. I think, and, and just opening up the agri market, you know, opening up, uh, allowing farmers to be able to sell their produce at an attractive price, uh, you know, interstate uh, trade, which is now allowed, the payment for e trading, etc. These are all path breaking changes. And I think these could, you know, if, if, if looked at the right <clears throat> way and if all stakeholders, you know, come and play a role in the medium to long term, I think this could be a re really big place where clean energy uh, India could play a very, very big role because as I said, I see both market demand as well as supply coming in. Another area which may not be very, very big, but I think would be very important from a clean energy perspective is healthcare and especially rural healthcare. Uh, I, I think there is tremendous pressure, not just on urban uh, systems right now, but rural is going to start collapsing very soon again you know, just because of the sheer number of cases that we are uh, seeing. And many of them, despite, you know, whatever uh, numbers we read, are still struggling for electricity. They're still unreliable electricity. And you can't provide quality health care to anyone if you do not have reliable electricity coming in. So you have to have proper health care solutions. If a vaccine gets developed soon, how do you really get that vaccine to, you know, a large rural population, which needs to be protected? And this is where, again, I think where distributed generation can really play a big role. But it will not it will not happen without uh, you know a bit of a policy push and for private sector to really realize that there is you know there's real potential here there's real demand and then they you know they just go after that. I'm going to skip the electric mobility part. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on uh, you know what I'm seeing in some of the other countries in Asia, especially uh, say Nepal, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia. I've not studied the reform packages there, but I know. That again, distributed generation, especially uh, rooftop solar for commercial and industrial uh, players, is something where there is focus. It is a growing segment. Uh, you know, again, it makes business sense. So I think in all the things that I've spoken about, it's not going to go if if everybody considers it to be the good thing to do, or you know, or it brings you good reputation. It now has to really move to the, if that's the right thing to do from a business profitability perspective. This is something similar to what I have uh, struggled with, you know, when it comes to including gender in energy. Till it is a good thing to do, it's, it's not really going to work. It has to make business sense for anyone who's trying to incorporate it. And now clean energy, uh, you know, is, is really at that point where we have to prove to everyone that this is, this is something which will help them scale up their business to global level, which is, you know, where, where India wants to be. So when it comes to these countries, uh, you know, I think it's important. If, if there is um, somehow an opportunity for them to learn from international best practices so that they shorten their learning curve, uh, you know, developers, customers, as well as investors, so that there are high performing projects which can be funded. And, you know, this would need knowledge and investment uh, support, which is both missing. And, and I know World Bank, ADB, et cetera, are trying to fill that gap. But uh, if that happens, then in some of these countries also, we'll see, you know, clean energy in this space really growing up. Um, so I, I, I just want to sum up and come to the financial institutions perspective that even if we have demand coming in from these sectors, you know, as, as the packages roll out, uh, what happens to the financing issue? I mean, financial institutions will continue to have the same challenge that they have had uh, with many of these technologies, you know, the, the payback periods, the size, the quality certification. So all of those challenges will continue and they will have to be taken care of again, you know, by initiatives and projects that we have. But I think it's important now for financial institutions and banks to understand that there are climate considerations that they need to incorporate in their financial risk management. All of them do stress testing and financial management almost, I mean, just a handful of them do, you know, any sort of a risk assessment from a climate perspective. They've not really analyzed the portfolio exposure to climate risk. And that is something which becomes very, very critical uh, right now. They have to have a view on the bigger picture and they have to aggregate, you know, look at an aggregation approach uh, for opportunities. And has again progressed a lot more in Southeast Asia when it comes to, you know, green deposits and green bonds and not so much in South Asia, especially India. And I think that's probably where, where something uh, could be done. Uh, having said that, I think all of this is possible only if, you know, there is a bolder and a clearer discussion across the country and across the globe on this clean energy transition Path. I mean, nobody has really come up so far and said that this is a missing piece of the stimulus package. So we have to have more discussions on this. And as Anish rightly said, you know, where 
to focus how much should be the fiscal package which sector i think there's more discussion on that 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 becomes an important part uh, of the conversation unless there's a conscious movement uh, you know all all the efforts that everyone has put for the last 15 years they'll end up going waste uh, for example and i i know our electric mobility expert will probably throw more light on this i was just reading about an wri research which states that you know in the wake of covid 19 global sales of electric vehicles are expected to plunge by more than 40% in 2020 and it has taken i know more than a decade for us to even get here for even people to start talking about electric uh, vehicles so you know if if we don't really address these concerns the entire market uh, could collapse i don't want to end on a negative note i want to say that i've also been reading about some positive examples uh, there are two which i can share with you again from a financial institution perspective that the central bank of philippines uh, you know in march approved a sustainability finance framework and that will just you know uh, it, it's it's going to go and get implemented to the other banks which is a great thing similarly recently in may uh, the hong kong monetary authority and security future commission have launched a green and sustainable finance cross agency steering group and this steering group is going to coordinate uh, you know uh, the climate and environmental risk to the financial sector and how do they accelerate the green finance growth this is exactly what is needed to be done you know in in south asia so uh, to sum up uh, you know i'm not going to deny that there are challenges there is there are a lot of missing things in our uh, reform and stimulus packages but uh, you know there's also an opportunity and that opportunity may take time uh, to pan out uh, and for us to really uh, scale it up but there is definitely i i i i am a very positive person so i'm seeing that opportunity and i think you know the new normal world would have uh, a major role for clean energy to play it needs that not just needs that push it needs that reform package so you know and i hope that happens so that that's all that i have to say and before i close i would thank all of you uh, for joining for asia foundation uh, to invite me and i hope all everyone's family and friends are doing well and you're all taking precautions uh, as much as possible in these trying times so thank you so much thank you so much uh, anjali for this very crisp insight um and to build on the discussion i now welcome dr ashwini kumar he will discuss the recent developments in renewable space in india and throw some light on opportunities for stronger regional cooperation in this over to you sir uh thanks uh, ananya good morning to all uh, first of all uh, word of thanks to asia foundation for uh, giving me opportunity to be amongst the i would say uh the all uh, season the campaigners for renewable energy i know anish i know anjali and uh, it's really difficult like anjali and anish have uh, really put uh, the global focus uh, which is there they have mentioned and they have brought it out very clearly that renewable energy is they are going to stay and that's seen as one of the uh, i would say uh, uh, the place where uh, you see comfort that uh, probably that will be uh, one of the solutions very potent solutions so coming to india i would uh, uh, say india is a unique uh, uh, uniquely placed if we just look at the kind of potential we have uh, in india it's a huge potential of renewable energy and we have a long history of working in renewable energy working right from uh, 1980 in fact india was uh, probably the first country to provide a separate administrative setup uh, to administer uh, the renewable energy uh, development uh, dissemination uh, in the country and uh, since then so uh, we are talking about when we talk about potential is already you know 750 gigawatt kind of potential has been worked out just based on 3% uh, wasteland uh, availability we are talking about 300 gigawatt of wind potential at a 100 meter habite if uh, the technologies are there and habite can further be increased the potential can go up uh, further then similarly a lot of uh, potential there is in biomass uh, uh, technologies in fact nowadays i wonder that uh, when anybody talk about renewable energy uh, is the you know they say that this is solar and wind which is freely available that definitely should be used but in addition to that for sustainability for everything you need to tackle the waste and whether whether it is uh, the waste from farming agriculture or municipal waste or anything you have to deal with that and that's say biomass so that's also picking up uh, another uh, i would say 
very important vertical as far as concerned to renewable energy. Uh, so apart from potential, India has a very strong uh, political commitment. Not now, but I think for the last 10 years, at least I have been in this area. And I know uh, since the launch of uh, solar mission in 2010, and since then there have been lo lo uh, looking back. Uh, we thought of 20,000 megawatt of utility scale power, and uh, today we are talking about 100 gigawatt. And our prime minister, he went uh, last year to um, uh, uh, UN uh, convention, and uh, uh, he addressed this UN Climate Action Summit in New York, September, and he uh, said for a very strong uh, uh, commitment for action, uh, climate action plan, we are going to do 450 gigawatt. So that's a huge number. If you just look at uh, the you know national electricity plan by central electricity authorities, so that's a government agency. That's a uh, uh, you know plan which is there in the uh, white and uh, uh, black. Total uh, installed capacity they are expecting uh, to be around 830 gigawatt by 2030, and RE is 450 gigawatt. And when they say RE. 450 gigawatt, they talk about solar 300 gigawatt, wind 140 gigawatt, biomass 10 gigawatt. And in addition to that, that's interesting that uh, it is recognized uh, by the premier uh, electricity uh, institution that uh, there would be requirement for grid, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, grid uh, integration of RE. And uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, calculated the uh, battery storage of about 136 gigawatt hour. So that's these are the numbers all there in the public domain. Maybe I can move to next uh, slide. Yeah, and the other, uh, I thought that uh, it will be good to know that what people have been talking about, about the storage, because uh, battery storage, grid requirements is one, but apart from grid requirement, a lot of many things uh, have started uh, happening, like in terms of electric vehicles, in terms of uh, two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers, and all. And this is one report uh, by Niti Ayo, prepared by uh, you know ISGF, uh, Indian Smart Grid Forum, and uh, they talk about huge numbers in terms of uh, the battery uh, storage. Uh, you know, by the end of 2022, they are talking about. 178, then they see that the demand will rise and the use of these things will happen. 529, so that's the kind of uh, you know battery storage we are talking about. So looking into these numbers, I would say this is the vision that people have thought. Maybe uh, anybody can argue that it can be 30% off, 40% off, or 10% off these numbers. And right now the electricity, the major issue is how to increase the electricity demand. But still, uh, you know, then in this perspective, let us bring the uh, COVID. COVID, as I see, uh, that is a, uh, I would say, transient uh, phenomena, which has happened, which is there. If we are talking about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years planning, like people are talking about 2050, then this is a phenomena. And uh, definitely this has to be tackled. The electricity demand and everything is, uh, uh, you know, uh, right now not known how it is happening, but it brings uh, in India. If we talk about it, brings several uh, positive positivities. Like uh, if you recall that on one day, on the uh, announcement by the, the honourable prime minister, all the lights were switched off, and all the electricity or power engineers were uh, curious that how do you maintain the grids. And they were expecting how much uh, impact is going to be by this uh, lighting of uh, the domestic lights. And at the end, what we noticed around 30 gigawatt kind of uh, that variation was there. And uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, further uh, strengthened one of the opinions that earlier there were huge talks that uh, grid stability, instability because of uh, large. Uh, I would say the integration of RE, but I think this one event proved that it can be managed. The people are wise enough and they, our electricity system network, the grid network is very strong, that can be managed. So it means now the position as far as concerned to India is that uh, 
uh, we have done i would say uh, uh, well uh, i am not saying exceptionally well but well uh, today we are standing somewhere 87 gigawatt if we see in terms of uh, the installed uh, re capacity and out of that uh, wind is still leading about uh, 38 gigawatt and uh, solar is also you know equal about 35 36 including the rooftop then some capacities from biomass power which is about 10 gigawatt and uh, 4.7 is a small hydro uh, you can remove the slide now so uh, uh, so uh, so so that's so if you just look at the target of 175 gigawatt by 2022 so we have reached halfway but rest halfway is a lot of challenging that how do you go but if we just start looking at uh, the uh, what are the good things what we could learn during this that uh, through solar mission and after that a lot of uh, government actions we are able to put up let us say a very robust policy framework whatever we see but there is a policy framework which has various regulatory measures fiscal measures financial measures and it started with like uh, some uh, i would say financial support in terms of vgf but later on uh, it's relying more now on the fiscal measures like uh, uh, we have uh, uh, you know dispensability that's one of the biggest concern in fact anish uh, mentioned that uh, pre covid the, uh, the adi country share in the overall energy mix was about 8.5% and even after uh, you know uh, 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 post covid so th that capacity that contribution is remaining same why it is happening because of the regulatory support which is coming from the uh, regulatory provision that merit order dispatch that's that favors the green energy and that's the right uh, decision so we have uh, those kind of system we have I would say the transparent uh, bidding mechanism, procurement uh, process. Though there can be various views that whether at this stage we should still continue with the uh, you know uh, bidding mechanism or reverse bidding, those kind of things, or we should stop it. But still, uh, I would say that till now, last 10 years, if we just look at uh, the solar progress, it is the result of this transparent mechanism. And then the government thinking that they brought in uh, I would say a central institution in the form of Solar Energy Corporation or the NTPC for bringing out these tenders. So that instilled the confidence in the IPPs that your, you will get your payments. I mean, it can be delayed, but you will get it because you are not dealing with the distribution companies who were seen in a bad financial health. So that kind of, <clears throat> then the policy provided some kind of payment security mechanism also. And then newer experience like uh, Anjali is here and IFC has done one experiment in Riva solar park and uh, that has come wonderfully and uh, two various I would say uh, improvements in the PPA mechanism and all uh, so uh, one of the best tariffs uh, was uh, discovered under that and there is no let up uh, after that the tariffs are um, you know, going down, the, the developers are coming forward, the financing are coming. Only very recently, one project uh, which was uh, awarded at 2.44 at that time to ECME, he has backed out. Otherwise, I think most of the projects they came, uh, you know, uh, online, they were uh, uh, executed, commissioned, and all. So, those kind of things happening. Uh, so, I would say so, what we got after doing this that now i know that uh, i said that 1980 onwards we are doing solar but till 2010 there was always uncertainty in the mind of consumers whether solar can deliver or not because we were dealing with very small electrical appliances like solar home systems and other things but after that now that debate is over people say yes it can deliver it is delivering so in the second benefit is the very big, uh, I would say, ecosystem in terms of the, I'm using the word assemblers or the manufacturers, uh, like modules are normally manufactured. So uh, that's there. So people now feel that if there is a problem, you can have uh, somebody around who knows about uh, solar. So that kind of ecosystem has come into place. 
and uh, uh, i think uh, the other uh, very very important thing which uh, further uh, before me the panelist mentioned is the innovation in the procurement tenders like the last tender round the clock path so that talks about i mean nobody thought that uh, the uh, re power is going to be i am not using the word discussable but at least with 80% or uh, plf kind of pause it can be set up so and that tariff is very very good tariff so definitely 30% less than the new coal thermal power plants so it means we have these case states where renewable energy probably uh, will soon be dispensable also with the addition of uh, battery storage and any other kind of storage the people are working on the hybrid plants again uh, you know the solar wind hybrid plus battery storage plus other things people are uh, moving with covid pandemic i would like to uh, uh, think uh, you know this has given rise to i would say international boundaries which were earlier disappearing and i would i would say in country within country also is giving rise to the states boundary also so that brings uh, you know i would say uh, some shift in the thinking that how you can go forward from this point i would like to think that now as far as concerned to conceptual uh, you know validation the round the clock power and those kind of things have been done it means now can there be state level planning can at the state level we can work out okay what are the kind of potential we have what is the kind of feasibility of round the clock power in my state is there and uh, we can look at that look at that we can have the procurement processes like that so that's one thing second thing definitely i think my heart goes to what anjali has said in fact i agree fully what uh, anjali said now the focus has to be on decentralized applications the government has already realized they have brought out a kusumi scheme they are talking about 17 lakh pumps and uh, i would like to further say that rooftop everybody talks about rooftop solar why it is not happening uh, i mean the way like uh, the uh, we all thought uh, i think uh, i was talking to ministry uh, very recently that uh, you are providing still some subsidy to domestic consumers for setting up rooftop why don't you bring out a scheme rooftop plus storage that has to be there people are using all inverters why that should be integrated with the solar if that kind of policy is brought out which i am sure will come in future in that case is going to be beneficial to the distribution company is going to be beneficial to the consumers apart from that anjali has mentioned about rural and agricultural economy i think the Uh, food processing chain the coal chain biogas generation uh, storage uh, everything is now uh, meaningful we talk about doubling the farmers income but through re that can be done easily we have been talking to msme msme says uh, ministry okay now on one hand you are allowing under kusum scheme to set up small uh, solar power project on the other side i have the industry um they want to have uh, you know uh, cheap power why can't they have direct uh, pps it means the question of business uh, models is coming in if there are business models definitely that can be there as a part of stimulus i would say that right now uh, the uh, you know as a part of financing uh, the uh, solar industry developers have to be supported in terms of that uh, they can go for setting up projects what very popularly we say on desco model kind of thing so that uh, as a consumer i know that what uh, prices i have to pay what tariff i have to pay for the power which i am buying and that kind of enabling mechanism uh, have to uh, come uh, so uh, i would like to uh, you know uh, conclude at this point that way forward for getting clean energy which uh, we have seen under this covid covid is the best uh, i would say experiment that uh, when everything is locked down you have we all have seen how clean was the air how clean was the environment uh, 
so if you want to be there so there is no other way that except to push the renewable energy and clean energy and uh, so decentralized applications rooftop solar pumps with battery electric vehicles these are the things through which re can further be supported thank you very much right now i would like to stop here and wait for the questions so again thanks to the participants uh, all uh, there yeah. thank you so much dr kumar for this very enlightening talk um, and now i invite dr dash uh, from ris who will talk to us about the low hanging policy fruit available to make smart energy choices from now on he will build on what dr kumar has told us over to you dr dash good morning all co panelists and uh, all our uh, distinguished participants and uh, Uh, good morning aninda ji nandita ji uh, first of all i uh, thank uh, isia foundation to invite me to this webinar uh, i think the interesting issues are already uh, surfaced uh, in the webinar in the last uh, half an hour see the interesting uh, development that covid has uh, thrown before all of us is to understand that is this new normal leads to something a structural change in in the way we have uh, seen energy policy in our countries and to integrate that energy policy with the national economic uh, policy in fact the development process so what i would briefly cover is the 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 uh, the larger context uh, uh, where we need to visualize the policy uh making process to evolve in the post covid era and how to characterize this new normal to be a sustained process before we move to another new normal and then uh we um skip this thing move to any other issue and we lose focus before that i just want to present some statistics which have already been shared by my other co panelists which would be interesting for everybody to uh um, take note of the reports uh, that have come up recently by uh, on sdg 7 on global economic uh, global energy review it keeps interesting uh, trends that the number of people uh, at the global level lacking access to electricity has dropped from 1.2 billion in 2010 to 789 million in 2018 that means 400 million plus reduction in 7 years that's something we um, which we need to be proud of but at the same time we have not experienced a significant and proportional drop in the population depending on say clean cooking gas or the, the people not using clean cooking gas so uh, so we have mixed results from that and there are estimations that suggest that overall greenhouse gas study the carbon emission reduction has taken place up to the level of say 80% 8% during this lockdown uh, and it, it gives uh, a sense to us that a better environment just now dr kumar was telling that the uh, we have better air now we have the low level of carbon emissions but these could be temporary also i have some other numbers if we see the the policy support the financing support uh, at a global level to say clean energy it was 10.1 billion in 2010 and it is now 21.4 billion which is which is more than double which is a good thing and the sdg 7 tracking report highlights that, that there are many areas uh, especially uh, the renewable uh, a uh, share of renewable energy use that has that, that is now 17.3% globally in the total energy consumption and if you see the uh, sector uh, it is more in terms of the access to electricity not necessarily in heating and transportation uh, sectors it is mostly in the uh, uh, electricity access and two two major drivers are solar pv and wind even though traditionally biomass was the dominant source of uh, say renewable energy generation now what does it tell 
that if at all we take this new normal uh, which has come uh, say um, realized in the form of uh, uh, the less dependence on fossil fuel or something how to visualize the and characterize the the uh, the months and years to come from here are we taking regional policy as a renewable energy policy transition more seriously than we are doing in a uh, business as well as usual scenario we need to be concerned about that there is some hint that uh, maybe uh, this can be integrated to the with the the kind of uh, uh, covid uh, packages that countries have uh, evolved in fact uh, the economic package by india has also addressed the issues faced by our discounts distribution companies their revenue loss the collapse in demand for so if as economists if i see it has to be a, a holistic strategy a three pronged strategy science policy and practice science means we need to see that how this renewable energy solutions be it solar pv be it wind be it say uh, ocean energy technologies which are not harnessed properly yet or not being recognized the way it should have been can we make it cost effective can we make it the first choice of the individuals the households the farms do you want to change the energy mix now the conventional energy must be constituting a large part of the total energy mix it needs to change and if i am given a choice i would rather go for putting a solar rooftop um, uh, in my house than going for the conventional energy but that does not really happen given a choice i would go for the same uh, conventional source of energy because we are not used to we have our attitudinal change has not happened so if we take the new normal as a given blessing in disguise then it has to be in the level of behavioral change that how renewable energy operating from home operating in less energy environment how to say reduce the the, the adverse impacts of the refrigeration say air conditioning in offices all these would be guided by a new energy consumption say uh, virtuous cycle where generation should happen generation will encourage uh, and should be affordable to everybody generation will uh, enhance the access and that access will translate into behavioral change that is farms also everybody off for renewable energy and we don't have to bother too much this process will go on but many of you would say that energy transition is already happening yes energy transition is happening it should happen it should happen in a way in a systematic fashion in a structured guided policy framework has to come out of this uh, learning that we have then uh, if we go by this science policy and uh, uh, practice thing what what should we do at the policy level the policy level it should be the domestic production generation of power uh, preferably from renewable energy sources as i said that uh, we have studied in the blue economy perspective ocean energy resources are pure clean that those can be easily converted into a very nice source of um, an efficient source of power for even household and for industry as well we need to scale up our investment scale up investment it at different levels when we talk to policy the science part as i said innovative technologies investing in r&d incentivizing those who are coming up with say affordable technologies and its commercialization policy would be how to frame uh, the certain policies that will uh, say inspire the innovators the entrepreneurs to go for renewable energy as a profitable industrial venture so their investment has to happen at all levels i think my previous speaker was talking about state and center the decentralized model that is a nice way of visualizing that's how we should be doing and we, we can scale it up to a very higher level when you talk about the international cooperation we have bimstec we have sarc we have g20 we have the brics at all these forums energy issues are now money issues not, not only because of covid 19 but also because of the seriousness the severe recognition of the impact of this kind of say uh, high carbon uh, um, economy that we are running now then i'll go to couple of other issues 
as far as policy is concerned, when we say investment, investment could be say domestically uh, mobilized or could be raised from say other sources. The other sources could be MDBs like AIIB, NDB, ADB. They are doing now. AIIB um, already has uh, um, energy sector strategy. NDB uh, aims to go for say 60% of the lending portfolio should be renewable energy. The president of NDB says uh, that. And uh, it is already resulting into uh, some sort of uh, say positive uh, note that they are actually engaged in funding clean energy and uh, renewable energy budgets. I do not know whether that is sufficient given the kind of uh, demand that we are uh, uh, witnessing now. Of course, the immediate priority would be for the energy sector to address the issues of collapsing demand. Because, because the marketing aspect, unless we address that, no firm would go further and think about, because energy transition is a durable process. It has to be guided in phases. Government has announced stimulus, then it will be subsequently expanding ministries and line ministries thinking about giving it a big push to that agenda, but which is again a very futuristic one. Uh, then I also, as I was referring to trade, the domestic production and generation of power, but what about trade? If India is running surplus, it should go to the neighboring countries. If Nepal has surplus, then there has to be proper framework of recognizing the energy corridors. Uh, our Minister of uh, MNRE and even Renewable Energy, they have identified the green energy corridors within the country. But if you expand that concept and take it to say Bimstead, take it to SARC, and say uh, to all other possible combinations of say power trade, that could also lead to a win-win for the, uh, the regional uh, cooperation framework um, um, paradigm. Uh, we, we can, um, ARENA has also something called the clean energy, clean energy corridors. They are also the aim to uh, say, um, make a smooth transition to uh, say renewable energy and clean energy and also promote trade uh, wherever possible. Like in Africa, uh, West Africa, and, uh, Central America, they have some projects and some sim similar kind of things can be tried out in this thing. Uh, now, what about the practice part of it? The practice part, I, I have some other numbers, but my previous speakers have already given, so I do not want to uh, spend time on that. The, the practice part is making policy may not be enough. We have seen enough policies in the past, unless the adoption of those policies is monitored and really evaluated uh, despite of the extraordinary circumstances like COVID-19 pandemic. What I'm referring to is that, as I said, that am I tempted to go for renewable energy solutions in my house for the consumption of power if I build a new house? If I open a farm or factory, Am I thinking of renewable energy as part of my energy mix? No, that has not come to that level. Once we successfully reach that level, once we successfully inculcate, look, renewable energy is not an option. It is a way of life. It is going to change your own life in a big way. Economy, um, economic aspects also, it, it says that it is favorable to you in terms of prices. But we do not realize that we are living in a high carbon polluting environment and we're not going to that. So how to promote this new normal, this greater recognition of now that everybody is realizing money cannot buy a solution to the COVID-19 problem. Be it developed country, developing country, wherever, whatever money you have, unless the vaccine is developed, everybody is at the same stage. So that realization has to come at the energy consumption level also. We need to change our behavior. Yes. Am I done? Yes, my time is to over? wrap up. Yes, yes. So we'll move yeah, to the two minute. Minute. Yeah. Yes. Just one minute. So if that is that is the uh, the evolving scenario, we need to have a couple of choices before us. And that choices would be like, uh, uh, say, uh, if you say that how to address the issues of market failure, how to pull the demand supply issues, and then, just a few seconds, we need to have 
say proper alignment of this policy with national economy policy subsidies for r and d efforts because initially these are high risk ventures how to mobilize private capital so venture capital fund security finance large scale integration of new technologies promoting co investment opportunities in financing because uh, this could be possible as high risk sectors so all this combined together with the integrated approach to address the the uh, the uh, energy uh, demand and the need for uh, enabling uh, and in uh, ensuring a smooth transition to clean and green energy thank you thank you so much dr dash for your uh, comments and uh, for your very enlightening talk you've covered a lot in your talk and now uh, we will have um, i invite my uh, our speakers to uh, kindly answer some of the questions uh, that our participants have uh, you've answered most of the questions i can see uh, but here are some more uh, so um, so the first question is uh, for for everyone and anybody who wants to take it out of our four speakers uh, so if any of you could comment on the significance of the one world one sun one grid initiative announced by india and how does it tie up with or complement the international solar alliance so uh, if i can have a go at it this is an issue i think it's uh, quite interesting okay. and in, in various groups we are seeing you know things which are in favor as well as people pointing out the difficulties i think there's a conceptual element which i am not clear about uh, is which is which is that you know without a political integration can you have such close integration on solar as a single technology okay that's that's something which is very important to understand because wherever there has been stronger uh, market integration or these kinds of measures taken say in europe I mean, then you, there is a big political uh, alignment which is achieved even the obor one belt one road uh, you know aims to first get the political entities aligned and then you go to the technological aspect so so i think that's something which i i'm not clear about what is the level of political alignment which we have got amongst the countries which we are talking about the second is that you know we are talking of a very large grid to be built now again the same question comes up very rarely have countries or continents built grids without that kind of alignment so europe has now a pretty much a cross european grid but which is essential for this uh, this whole concept but it does uh, you know we suppose a political combination or alliance or or integration before the 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 energy integration on that scale so that is uh, the second question and the third question of course is that whether it makes uh, full economic sense i know that we are trying to you know address the the divergence of daylight hours uh, between the various places and trying to capture you know conceptually sounds right but i'm not sure time of ac there seems to be enough uh, expert voices which say that you know it's it's a little too conceptual at this stage uh, i uh, would like to add a little like uh, earlier also there have been a project called desert tech and then it was planned that uh, the solar can be set up somewhere in africa region and power can be brought to europe Uh, but as anish has brought out political will the large very large requirement of the investment in setting up uh, grid lines these are very very uh, i would say difficult areas but certainly at regional level probably a beginning can be made may i please ask the speakers to switch on their videos right now as you speak thank you Yes, Doctor Kumar. Please go ahead. I thought I have completed <laughs> my, uh, you know, uh, uh, addition to what Anish said. That what I am saying that probably this concept can be tried at regional level, like in the neighborhood countries and all. And India is already, uh, you know, have some trade uh, with some of the neighboring countries. Maybe that way it can increase. But I think on a 
very broad level, a lot of investment and in setting up infrastructure and all, that's really very, very critical. Uh, so, so I can move on to the next question and if, if everybody's answered this question. So the next question uh, is about balancing power. We talk a lot about renewables. We spoke a lot about renewables here and uh, we were trying to understand uh, how South Asia as a region can move towards energy transition. How does balancing power when we have renewable energy uh, fit into this context? Uh, if you look at See, the, I, sorry, please, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I, I can, I can come up. Okay, if you look at uh, the South uh, um, Asian countries, I think hydro is the main source of power, and uh, I would like to guess that uh, hydro is a part of uh, a strategy for balancing power. Plus, I think battery storage or biomass. Uh, this can be another option. Uh, see, the response to this question would be uh, uh, the energy mix. The energy mix, if that is the question, then as, uh, as we uh, observe, uh, there is a greater recognition that we should move towards renewable energy, clean energy. But the way we are doing or uh, implementing our policy is not at that level of pace which we can say overnight there is a significant change in the power mix but certainly there are uh, encouraging trends that you see from uh, in the region in the south Asian region the political environment may not be conducive to talk about trade investment cross border at this stage but all the regions because uh, nepal uh, bhutan all these they are small countries they are producing electricity they would always like to export to some other country so there is a greater willingness to engage uh, but it has to uh, be uh, a gradualistic process. Uh, in, in fact, the India-Bangladesh uh, power trade issues uh, is, uh, is uh, one of the uh, major uh, policy issues uh, 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 that both the countries are now dealing with. If I can just, you're on mute, Anindya. Uh, but if I can just add a quick word on this one, you know, one is that we look at supply side sources for all, all of these answers. But I think we should also look at two things. One is the markets, uh, because markets allow us to capture the whole diversity and flexibility which is available. And uh, we have just started, we don't have a very deep market, but we do have a diverse market with RTM also coming in, real time markets coming in. So that that should help quite a bit. And second thing is that we should never underestimate the value of a large integrated grid. It does allow us a lot of flexibility to absorb renewable energy, uh, when, especially when aided by markets and you know, other means. So that's a unique position that India has. Very few countries have that. So we should be able to absorb. So just to uh, Dr. Shani Kumar's point, you know, we, we started the lockdown at eight and a half. We actually today at 11 and a half percent renewables and through the lockdown period, including high demand periods, we have been at 11 and a half. And I suspect one of the reasons we have for that is the robust grid that we have. So it's able to absorb all the renewables that is being produced when we are willing to absorb it, when we don't want to curtail it intentionally. Uh, thanks, Anish. Uh, so now we have another question from, uh, from one of our participants. Uh, and since there was so much thrust on decentralization, um, Ashwini Ashok is asking us if there is a need of mini grid policy and regulation, um, and also how can we resolve uh, the issue of financing uh, mini grids? Do you think we need a policy? Uh, I can take that I, up. Okay. Uh, uh, Anjali, uh, no, I, would no, like no, no, uh, I would like to mention just one thing. Uh, Tata Power uh, very recently has taken up a project for setting up 10,000 mini grids with support from Rockefeller Foundation. That's one statement. Second thing, mini grids are going 
to be very important because I think a lot of these developments are related to amendment in the electricity policy. And, and later or sooner, these policies will be aligned and this market or this mode will be further developed. Uh, uh, Anjali, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, sorry, Malvika, I'm not able to switch on my video. It says the host has stopped it, maybe some technical issue. So let me just try and respond to that question. It's actually very, very close to my heart. It is, it is an open wound uh, and a sore point that, that the policy never uh, became final. So, you know, I think it's, but it's still never too late uh, because Minigrid will continue to be important. And as I said, because of the focus on distributed generation and rural growth, I think if something can be done even now, uh, it will be great. But the policy has to be holistic. It has to look at, uh, you know, exit mechanisms and financing in, in a proper uh, investor, with, with an investor's lens and not just uh, from a developer's lens. So I think that that's something which will be very, very important. Uh, if that policy happens, it will be great. In fact, uh, you know, I think India suffered quite a bit when it comes to private sector investment because of lack of policy. I think a number of mini-grid players would vouch for the fact that they had advanced discussions with many investors, but it did not go through because we did not have regulatory and policy clarity. Some of them still went ahead and have set a mini-grid system without having full clarity on policy just being demand driven but that's not the right approach uh, you know in any in, in any country in any government to follow and which is why you know the kind of scale up that we should have seen 5 years ago has not happened uh, dr ashwini kumar mentioned about the tata power uh, rockefeller uh, initiative uh, you know that that's a great initiative and i hope that will really plug the gap and will also build investor confidence but definitely without you know a solid uh, regulation, it is going to be tough to get private financing uh, into the sector. Can I just add a little bit of uh, flavor to that? So two things. Uh, one is that, you know, Anjali, since you're a positive person, you know, the, the drop in the renewable energy prices should add to the future prospects and, you know, add to and you know, heal your sword wounds, as you say, you know, as we go forward. Because when, uh, solar becoming cheap and eventually storage becoming cheap is possibly going to aid that process much more than it has done in the past. But I think there's a second dimension to it on which I'm less confident. But what I see in the newspapers and uh, is about tariff reforms where you know the government is talking about voltage-wise tariffs and not category-wise tariffs. And one of the biggest uh, challenges for mini grids has been the distorted tariff structures and hence the distorted incentives. If that incentive distortion can be taken care of, then there's a very large chance that mini grids will automatically be enabled. I'm not taking away the fact that government needs to enable and uh, have an enabling policy for mini grids, but I'm saying that there are other enablers if they come in place, uh, which anyway need to be fixed one way or the other, then those will he help mini grids as well. Um, Anish, since you at the beginning had made uh, an employment versus environment point, um, there is a question I think which which can be answered by you. So someone is, um, uh, yeah, Kapil Thukral is saying that India is projected to have more stranded coal assets by 2040 than any other country. And uh, if you can provide any thoughts on what can be done to um, kind of fix the scenario in a way that's not uh, you know, that doesn't lead to too, too much employment loss or systemic shock, etc. So, so the first thing, of course, is that we have coal-fired assets and many of them have been taken into reserve shutdown even in this period because mm -hmm. utilities are recognizing that if there are renewables available, then there's no point running coal in, in, a, in a Karnataka or in Punjab. It doesn't make economic sense. So whatever be the consequence, it's a positive consequence you know, because we're seeing renewables being cheaper. And the upshot of that in the longer term is that we just don't need to build any more, not a single megawatt of coal beyond this. We already have enough capacity. We should just look to use it as it is required by the grid and where the financial requirements are, uh, you know, suffice or, or support that. Uh, the second part, which is a little bit what I mentioned, is that you know, mining as a sector is a very precarious sector. It it adds to in employment, it also adds to the lot of revenues for the central and state governments. It's one of the biggest income generators. Okay, 
so that's when the there's a there's a big dichotomy while right? at one level we talk about you know green policies and green growth and the fact is that at the other instance in the the biggest policies which we are driving today are on mining including on coal okay so there is a dichotomy which is playing out and we also must remember that coal india itself is a large organization it feeds lots of people lots of areas it has lots of right interests and vested interests created around it okay and they can respond back okay so today uh, we are already seeing uh, coal india respond back and for them if that's their growth then they'll try to expand their capacity and supply coal possibly even cheaper than today so there could be a competitive response from coal india okay and we are not saying that they should remain inefficient okay but at the same time that capacity expands then there is a you know counterproductive thing which in comes so there's a dichotomy you know that if we coal india produces more or a mining sector in general produces more then it adds to the local economy employment all of those things which we talked about but it's goes straight against the environmental cause uh, which we have so there's uh, I, i mean there's no easy answer to that but there's a dichotomy yeah. thank you uh, anjali may i direct this question to you you had uh, made this point about uh, you know including gender in the power sector in the energy sector and that uh, you know making business sense uh, could you please throw some light on uh, what is it that can be done uh, to make women not just recipients of uh, energy of some kind but also the decision makers in what kind of energy should be used and how it should be used okay um so let me try i mean it doesn't really fit into the discussion that we are having but the reason i gave that example was uh, because in my mind until you are able to prove that there is a business case uh, no private sector player be it a developer be it a customer is going to pick up you know what you are offering and what we have seen in the at least in the distributed generation operate energy sector is that so we kept saying that you know you need to have more women participation uh in the sector be it you know whether they are selling these product they are using these product you know they are entrepreneurs uh, nobody was listening to us till you prove that there is a business model which can really work till you prove that it makes uh, economic and business sense and it is profitable and we proved that in the last 5 years with a couple of companies that i have worked in where we have uh rural energy access business models completely driven by women some are even women owned businesses where women are also selling and providing after sales services they are also the decision makers in the sense of you know what product to buy what work uh, for them and also participating in developing new products so there are lots of examples that i uh, have in that case uh, so i was just trying to take that analogy that you know till you keep saying that something is good and you know you should do it it's not going to happen till you prove it by numbers and till you prove to, till you really show it uh, by doing it and implementing it you're on mute anindya i can't hear you yeah. uh, thank you thank you for your response anjali uh my last question for all of you we have hardly spoken about ev and storage and uh, those policies are also uh, you know something that we want to see uh, more on we want to have more clarity on those and then there's also this whole whole dimension of behavioral change when we speak of evs charging um and of course there is storage so may i please have some response from our speakers on that Should I start? Yes, please. Yes, I have already mentioned this, but some of these points I missed. Maybe I just add one point to that employment question. You know, this employment uh, environment trade-off has always been a tricky issue. You could switch from one model of production uh, that involves energy, raw materials, and others to another form. A new uh, set of skills you may need. it may be a replacement of one category of employees with another category of employees the fear that we are having with artificial intelligence and robotics all this there will be displacement of the labor in that sense but certainly uh, it would be helpful one number that i have that globally uh, there is a positive story i do not know which region is contributing to this 
that the total uh, jobs in the renewable energy sector has increased from 7.3 million in 2012, 2012 to 11 million. So, uh, geographical distribution, how is it happening? One has to see. On the behavioral change, as you uh, rightly say, see uh, how many of these new virtues of energy consumption is actually absurd. When you say integrating with the national economic policy, now we are talking about COVID-19. The moment you move to a new normal, that everything comes back to the status quo. People start abandoning certain things which the severity gets lost. So how to sustain that new normal for some time? How to make people realize that from time to time new issues like this would come up? As I said, you have money but you can't help yourself in treating COVID-19 pandemic. So what does it say? The same energy crisis may happen. So it has to be institutionalized. I framed a sentence yesterday, I forgot where I have written, institutionalizing the, the realization that we have in some way and communicate to people. Look, you are only facing the difficulties. Governments alone cannot do, private sector cannot alone do. It has to be an integrated approach from all quarters of the society, everybody's contribution. Uh, Anandia, in, addition, Anandia, in addition to other things. Okay. And Anandia, uh, can I... Uh, can I come here? Yes, sir, please. Please go ahead. You know, uh, I see electric vehicles uh, basically an issue of battery manufacturing because uh, we always take a, an analogy with solar PV. Like uh, we started using solar PV, but somehow India missed the bus of PV manufacturing. We could not uh, be there. Similarly, in battery, we have to take a stand. We have to come and uh, start to manufacturing. Niti Aayog has brought out FAME 1, FAME 2 schemes which supports uh, you know, manufacturing of battery, but I think that's not enough. And what I see in the larger context, because if I see the renewable energy, then grid integration is an issue. Batteries also require their a decentralized level, whether it is rooftop or whatever. And in EVs also battery is required. So I think that synergy is there. And when we talk about EVs, whether we like it or not, but you see a lot of two-wheelers, a lot of three-wheelers, rickshaws, already there. So I mean, you can't stop that. That's there. So you have to regulate it. You have to capture this market. So to me, this is more related to very quick I would say uh, policy for uh, uh, supporting the manufacturing uh, of uh, batteries. Uh, okay, this brings us to the end of our Q&A uh, session. I'll quickly sum up what uh, we discussed in this webinar and what are the key takeaways from our uh, eminent speakers. Um, so, um, the webinar which wanted to make uh, a case for the uh, interconnection of energy and climate. Uh, Anish Day pointed out uh, that the stimulus that we need, um, you know, it, we need to figure out where the stimulus, stimulus needs to go and what are the tools uh, that can be used um, to make it green. Um, and uh, Anjali, I think, uh, took this point forward and she spoke about uh, how MSME is really a big opportunity for uh, reducing emissions and making, uh, uh, you know, our, you know, their energy mix more green, um, uh, how to in incentivize energy efficiency by targeting the MSME sector. A lot of stimulus uh, package uh, from India has gone to the MSME sector and also um, addressing the question of reverse migration and focus on a rural economy and how to create opportunities using green energy in the rural economy. Uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar uh, has emphasized how uh, green energy is something uh, that is not a question of debate. Solar has ended all debates over the years. He's been watching the renewable energy sector for very many years now. And so the next question that we are faced with is a question of business models. And um, what models can attract investments? What, what makes sense? 
and uh, and he also kind of emphasized and took forward anjali's point on doubling farmer income uh, using renewable energy and india has is using a lot of technology already in the rural and agri fields which has a lot of scope to be taken forward uh, finally dr dash uh, emphasized attitudinal change through the new normal of of the covid and how behavioral change would be a key uh, in, in influence in how energy transition can happen he also made the point that energy transition uh, needs to happen in a structured way uh, and it has to happen consistently in phases and you cannot do it um, and then not do it and uh, divert focus so these are our key takeaways uh, from this uh, webinar that we've had i now hand over to uh, our country representative nandita barua uh, to to thank our speakers and to formally end the webinar over to you nandita thank you so much um, thank you uh, everybody i mean a big thanks of course to the speakers and the panelists but also to the participants i think i want to end on a note of uh, the you know what what anish you began by saying saying this is going to be a battle on of climate versus employment environment versus industrial growth and the choices that countries make uh, will have to be thought through very carefully and i think the the second part of the issue is that a choice that a single country makes is going to also have a regional and a global impact so the next question is how are we then integrate our choices with what the impact is going to be in the region because climate or environment is not something that is geographically contained right um, and the choices that we are going to make on energy is therefore going to have an impact beyond uh, our borders and beyond beyond and i think those issues are then related to the structural reforms that dr ashwini kumar anjali and uh, dr priyadarshi das talked about us saying where is it that we need the key structural reforms but are they also backed by the principal value behind that reform and that's again the question which you put forward anish is it is it global good versus finance um whatever we do in this sector these will be the key movers that i think we have to keep our eye on and really inject the discourse with everything that you have you all have said today uh, and how do we take forward so for, on behalf of the foundation what i would like to say is that for us this is an ongoing discourse we think that we would like to continue to engage with uh, stakeholders like yourself those who are the speakers but also the participants to see how we can move this discourse in the direction that we'd all like to see um, you know work in our own spaces to make the changes possible so um, i think that uh, you know this is just just like i said it's it's just a beginning of a series of conversation which we hope will uh, be pushed into a larger public debate a policy debate Um, not just within india but beyond its borders so thank you so much everybody for being here with us today there were many more questions and i know we didn't have the time to answer all of that but what we do is that we do have the list of all the participant speakers when we send out the report we will try and annex these questions and we may come back to you the speakers to seek answers which were targeted specifically to you the questions and put that in the report and share it with you so thank you very much and we really appreciate your making time to be with us um, thank you again thanks a lot thank you, thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you very much bye